All right, let's get started. Hi, everybody. Welcome to our webinar about uh, reopening your store, what we know now. Um, it's a, a fairly uh, wild time, as we all know. And um, we've been watching some stores open now across uh, the country and actually across the world even in, in uh, other places. Uh, my company, Retail Smart Guys, works with retailers in 16 countries today. And so we're watching how this is happening both across the United States and internationally to see what people are doing and how they're doing it and how the stores are opening and what's working, what's not working, what's the mood out there. Um, so I'm going to share all of that with you and we'll talk through a lot of different areas um, about opening your store and things that you've got to think about and some considerations uh, that uh, I think are going to be important for you as you get this thing going. Now, I will tell you, uh, today's webinar is being recorded. So um, uh, you will get uh, to a link to the recording. You will also get copies of all the slides. Uh, and I'm also going to include uh, some links and some supplemental materials I think that will be helpful for you so that you can do the best job of reopening your store. I did this webinar a little bit ago. I'm doing it again now because we've learned a couple more things since a couple stores have opened uh, around the country. And um, uh, it's a little different than what I initially thought. So uh, I'm excited to share some of that with you. So let's just jump right in. Okay. Uh, first, a little bit about me. Um, I'm the president of a company called Retail Smart Guys. I myself have worked in retail for a little over 40 years. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, I started when I was 17, so you can do the math <laughs> all by yourself. Um, my company, Retail Smart Guys, focuses heavily on merchandise planning, cash flow planning. We also do some work in marketing. We do some work in um, uh, personnel issues and things like that. Uh, so, um, we pretty much are generalists in the world of retail and work with lots of different retailers. And so we're excited to, to share some of this information with you. Uh, and yes, I, um, you guys have seen me on TV. There's a picture of me there with Larry David when I was on Curb Your Enthusiasm. And then there's also a picture of me recently when I did a commercial for Facebook. I will tell you this, that uh, before this whole pandemic nightmare started, I was already due for a haircut. So the haircut you see in this picture is nothing like what I look like now. I'm sort of... Uh, very Jackson Brown around nine. Uh, I'm sorry, Jackson Five around 1973, 1974. So, you know, you should be glad that you're only seeing the slides and not seeing my head right now. It's a it's a disaster. Um, uh, but there I am. That's a, that's a little bit about me. So you know who's presenting to you today. Uh, but before I get started, I really want to do a little shout out to my friends at Complete Data Systems. Um, they're the guys that are sponsoring this webinar, so my thanks um, to Jason and to Michael and to JC and everybody over at Complete Data Systems. They're pretty cool guys, and they have uh, they really know their stuff in terms of point of sale. Um, if you're on uh, Retail Pro, they're the guys to go to. They certainly know it really, really well. Um, and uh, I put their contact info and their phone number there uh, and their website. So if you're looking at POS, you're thinking about POS, you've got issues in POS, Please reach out to, to uh, my friends here at CDS. These guys are really, really good, and they know what they're doing. Okay? All right. So, so there's some things you've probably already heard. I'm not going to do this with you again, okay, because I don't know about you, but if I hear one more time that these are unprecedented times, that retail's never going to be the same again, and you know, we're all in this together, and all these things that you've heard I, I listed on this slide, I don't even want to say it again anymore ever, okay? I think it's just enough, you know? Um, um, I, I think that. Uh, um, we're doing a great job with, with uh, navigating this stuff and getting through it and, and all that kind of thing. But I think it's super important um, that we all fight our way through this thing and don't think about some of these negative things. I think that the thing you've got to do for your own sanity is, first of all, you got to get pumped up about your store. Okay? You got to get psyched. You got to get you got to think about it almost as if you were like how you were thinking about your store or your stores when you were doing the grand opening. Right. I mean, that's kind of the, the perspective and the point of view I think you need to have in order to be able to get through this thing. OK, now, uh, I think you got to stay safe. You got to get others to stay safe. You've got to um, make sure that you're uh, doing everything and promoting everything that says that you're staying safe, that kind of thing. Uh, I don't want you to get drawn into the negativity. There's enough of that out there. You don't get so get worried about that. Um, if you are worried about your store, if you are worried about your future, the word, the antidote to that has always been an action plan. We're very, very big on that, so keep that going. And really stay connected to us, both to Complete Data Systems and to Retail Smart Guys. Um, 
the difference between us and most of you is that we're talking to different retailers every single day. And so we're hearing the greatest hits of what's working out there. And we want to share those things with you. We want to make sure that you're doing those things as well. And we want to give you every tool that you can possibly have uh, as independent retailers to get through this thing. Okay. Now, um, what is it like out there right now? Well, you know, it's interesting. Um, in terms of opening conditions, most places around the country, the states are establishing the rules about uh, capacity, right? And they're saying things like you can be at 25% capacity or 50% capacity. It's typically dependent upon the fire code, right? Whatever the fire marshal says is the number of people that can be in your store. Um, they'll give you a percentage of that, right? They may say... Uh, uh, gee, you know, you can be 25% uh, of capacity or 50% of capacity. It's differing from stores from state to state. Some states are, are you know, 50%, some are at 100%. You got to watch that and see what that looks like, okay? I still think social distancing is important, but I will tell you that in lots of states that are 100% open, like I've heard it for Georgia, I've heard it for Texas, that people don't seem as worried as you would think um, uh, about this. You know, they just seem like, well, we're going to do it. We're going to open up. We're going to be here. And uh, if my customers aren't wearing masks, we're not wearing masks. Honestly, I think, uh, uh, you know, you got to show that you're cautious. And I'm going to talk more about that in some future slides. But um, you have to demonstrate that you're being safe because all it takes is for one person to freak out on your selling floor. All it takes is for one person or a couple people to write nasty Yelp reviews to distract you from where you need to be and what you want to do. OK, I do think you're going to be expected to police uh, this and police what comes into your stores. I have some ideas about that. I'll share that in a couple of minutes. Um, but I do think you're going to be expected to police that. You've got to start thinking about that now, both in terms of your staff and in terms of your customers. OK, it's far more political than it should be. Wouldn't you agree? I mean, you just have to scroll Facebook for about five seconds to see that there are people that are all over some conspiracy theories and all over the, the thing that, look, you know, this virus is huge and we should all stay home for forever. And I can tell you from talking to lots of different retailers, man, the differences in opinion are as broad as you can imagine. There are people that think we shouldn't open till December. There are people that think, you know, we should have opened already. It's just all over the place, okay? So as you start to open your stores, there are going to be lots that support it, and there are going to be lots that aren't, you know? That's going to be true for customers. It's going to be true for staff. It's going to be true for vendors, for people that service your stores, and that kind of stuff. I think the place to be in this one, frankly, is the middle, okay? I think you want to be open. You want to continue to do business. You want to be safe. You want to show that you're being safe. You want to make sure that everyone is comfortable and happy inside your store, okay? Um, so in terms of thinking about your store and what do you have to do, I have it broken into these couple of sections that we'll go through today. I'm going to talk first about floor layouts and store appearances. Uh, then we'll get into a little bit about marketing, which, of course, is all about creating demand. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about how people are using selling at a distance uh, to continue to get some sales going. We'll talk a little bit about staffing and what's happening with them. Uh, certainly, I'm going to talk about merchandise because I do believe that's the most important thing for us to talk about. I kind of put it a little later in the presentation, but it's probably the thing that's going to drive your revenue more than anything else. And lastly, I'm going to talk a little bit about finance. I'll talk about what's going on with the PPP. I'll talk about what's going on with the EIDL. I'm going to talk about all that kind of stuff. Okay? Um, so we'll have all of that cooking. All right, here we go. So first, let's talk about store appearance. I want to talk about the storefront first, okay? Um, now, the logo appearance. For for this um, uh, the logo for this whole pandemic has been um, the the little rainbow sign. So I think it's probably not a bad idea to hang some of those. And I think you know that you want to hang up some signs to say we are back. We're here. We're 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 we miss you. We're hope we're glad to be here and to generate something that generates some excitement about recycling. Okay. I think you want to have lots of signs up front. You want to make sure that your front looks clean. It looks safe. It looks like you're you're uh, uh, open and friendly and welcoming. I mean, those things were always true, right? But even more true now, we've got to show that things are really in great shape, okay? And especially now, your front windows need to change at least weekly. Here's why. Even as states start to open, and people are driving around. They're not just diving into every single store they see. So they're kind of driving around and picking their spots. And so they may drive by your store uh, and look at it and go, oh, okay, okay, <laughs> that kind of thing. But they may come, they may, they may see if your store's windows are changing that you are active 
and you are there, and that's going to draw them in, maybe not in week one, but certainly week two and week three. And I frankly think that weeks two and three, as the stores open, are probably more important than week one. Week one, there will be a little bit of a spike, and we're seeing some of that where, you know, as soon as you open, people want to get in there, people who especially love your store and want to support you. Then there's a little bit of sort of a lull that happens, and then it starts to ramp up again. I've watched a lot of stores in Georgia and a lot of stores in Texas go through this. They open, and they get to maybe... Uh, in the first couple of days, they're, they're somewhere between 50 and 70% of last year's sales. And then um, uh, then they kind of drop down a little bit, and then they kind of ramp up and ramp up and ramp up. And some of them actually, believe it or not, are meeting, and some of them are actually beating last year's sales. So it's been an interesting time. There's certainly a great deal of, of pent-up demand out there and lots of cabin fever out there. And they can't go other places, right? They can't go to big arenas. They can't go to theaters. They can't go to places that they normally might want to congregate their best and safest activity is your store. So make it welcoming. Let them see that right from the storefront. Okay? Now, once they're inside the store, okay, there's this thing called the decompression zone. Okay? Um, and uh, the decompression zone is the first 5 to 15 feet of your store. It really depends on how much square footage you have. And by the way, the stuff that I'm showing you right now, I want to give a shout out to my friends at Kaiser and Bender. Uh, a lot of this is stuff I've learned from them, and I'm going to uh, share their information with you in a little bit here, okay? But um, Kaiser and Bender uh, coined the phrase the decompression zone, so I want to give that out to them. It's the first couple of feet when people walk into your store, okay? And basically, it's kind of like, I walked in, <sighs> I'm in, okay? Um, so you want signage that welcomes them, but also makes them feel safe and lets them know you're doing all the right things to keep the store safe, okay? Um, now, once they get in there and they're at the edge of that decompression zone, they need to say, um, uh, um, uh, they need to see your whole store. They need to see the vista of your whole store. What's going on out there? Where else can I be in the store? What else do I want to look at, right? It gives them a chance to sort of map out where they might want to be. So lots of interesting stuff needs to be there, right? Lots of stuff that they want to be able to look at when they're looking there, okay? Now, of course, the immediate right, many, many of you know this, when anyone, anyone walks into a store, the first place they go is to the right. That's not my information. Or, uh, Kaiser and Bender will tell you that too, by the way. But I, we've seen it. We've seen it happening all the time. Um, so the, the space to the immediate right is, is really important. It's your most important real estate in terms of actual shopping. The vista that they see is places that they're going to target to go, but the immediate right is the stuff you want to make sure you've sold through. So your, your best merchandise and the stuff you want to move through should be right there to the right, okay? Um, I think you still want to ensure some social distancing, okay? So now, here in Los Angeles where I am, lots of grocery stores now have an established path. So when you go to the grocery store now, you can't just sort of walk wherever you want to go to, right? You can't go, okay, I want eggs, I want bread, I want milk, I'm going to go to those couple places. Oh, and I want to get over to the, to the uh, grocery set, you know, to the, to the, um, uh, to where the, the fresh fruits and vegetables are, okay? You can't just do that now here. You have to actually get on a path and walk around the store, kind of like what Ikea does, right? That's kind of how that goes. Um, and by the way, most of the aisles are now one-way streets. So if I get halfway down an aisle and I realize I forgot something, sorry, I got to go all the way through the whole store and wind all the way around uh, uh, to get back in there. Now, this is a good way to sort of, uh, you know, um, to ensure that there is some social distancing happening, right? Because that way everybody's on a path, no one's turning around, no one's accidentally bumping into each other, that kind of stuff, okay? So I think that's a good idea, and I think there's some opportunity there as well, which I'll talk about in a moment. But this this way you can keep some social distancing there, if your store can allow it, okay? And I think as you know, they wander through the store, you want some signage up that talks about social distancing, that keeps them safe. But please, do not make these signs negative or no or that kind of thing, okay? I'll give you an example, right? You know, you, you, you've seen in lots of supermarkets now, it's, you know, lots of negative signs and big red slashes and things before you walk in, right? You know, if you're sick, don't come in here. If you think you're sick, don't come in here. If you're, you know, uh, one of the groups that's that's more susceptible to this, don't come in here, you know, that kind of stuff. And lots of reasons to say no to things, right? Um, I think it's time to get creative and make more more yeses. So, like, as an example, one of my stores is a, is a Western store. They sell, like, Western boots and, and uh, denim and stuff like that. So, you know what sign she has up? Her sign actually says, you know, there should be a cow's distance between us, right? That's a great, clever way to sort of separate the distance between 
uh, well, how far apart we should be. So think of ways that you can do that that are not no's, that are reminders of the social distancing without it being a super negative thing, okay? I think you want to put some floor decals on the floor. That helps them kind of know where they're at, okay? And if you've got some audio in the store, I think on top of the music that you're playing and that kind of stuff, um, um, uh, so... Um, I think that it's important for you to have those decals down there so they can see where they're at. But I also think the store audio, just remind them every once in a while, hey, guys, you know what? We're all staying safe. Let's please make sure that there's distance between us. Let's make sure that, you know, we're, we're doing all the right things, okay? Um, now, I think your displays have a bigger role than they've ever had before. Okay, so again, from that decompression zone, can they look around the store? Can they pick where they want to go? Do you, are your displays multiple level, right? So they, you know, it's okay to put stuff on the floor. It's okay to put stuff up a little bit, that kind of stuff. So multi-level, I think, is good. Adding lots of props, I think, is good. Cross merchandising, so it's not just one thing, is a good thing. Okay, those displays should constantly change so that when people do come into your store, they see new things, that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, the, we always refer to the displays as the silent salesperson, but they're not so silent anymore, especially if we're going have to sell from six feet away so really we think you're you know as you open your floor really we think how those displays look and what someone sees when they walk this when they walk the floor so this is a good time for you to walk your own floor again with a brand new set of eyes as if you've never done it before uh, kaiser and bender refer to certain points along the floor as speed bumps right which is places where people have to stop and look at stuff Right? So have you created, as they walk that path that you've set for them, some speed bumps along the way? Are there places where they just got to stop and look at stuff, right? Um, and is that, again, is there bundling and cross-merchandising there? And if someone doesn't want to stop there, can they get around those people and still obey some of this social distancing? Okay, so can we get around them safely? Okay, and even if they did stop at that speed bump, once they're done with that speed bump, like what is the vista like? What's the view like from there? Where are they going to go next, right? You want to lead them through the store, right? At the same time, when we talk about these speed bumps, let's make sure there's nothing that inhibits them from getting to, to things, right? Too high, they got to reach around, they got to do something that's going to make them uncomfortable, that kind of stuff. It's a time to look and say, it's look at the, your floor and see, is there anything stopping anyone from getting anywhere, okay? And I'll tell you this, more than ever, your lighting for your store is important. As you do these speed bumps, are they well lit? Do they shine the merchandise? Do they, do they, is it like it's everything's in the spotlight that makes these things even more appealing and shoppable than they've ever been? So it's a good time to rethink your lighting. But walk your whole floor, walk up and down, take a look and see where are people going to stop? Do I have enough space for social distancing? And is everything cross-merchandised and bundled and as attractive as it can be? I think if people shop, you know, there will be some that just, that just feel like, I want to get out and then I want to get home, right? Uh, again, the ones that are more nervous about this. If you've got some of those guys, you know, you want to encourage more units per transaction, a larger average dollar sale by making things accessible to them so you can get bigger sales from fewer transactions, okay? Uh, so, again, signage, I think, is important. It's got to do something that's selling for you because we're going to be kind of distant from people, okay? I think you need more of them up in the store than ever before. That said, uh, there's two types of signs, according to Kaiser and Ben. There's storyteller signs that kind of say, you know, imagine what this is going to look like. Her example um, was, uh, imagine the, the look on your kids' faces when they get these backpacks. But you can extend that to anything in any kind of merchandise, right? Imagine how great you're going to look when you finally get to go to someone's house again. <laughs> imagine uh, how great you're going to feel um, in this denim. Um, imagine how great these uh, th this jewelry is going to look around your neck. You know, any of those things you can do like that. So some of these storyteller things that kind of talk about what life will be like when you've got the when when they purchase that product, okay? And then there's also product selling signs, which are feature signs, right? What are the features of the product? What do people want? Um, I talk a lot about um, in, in workshops about how do you sell to millennials and stuff like that, and, and groups that are, are a bit younger that are, are more accustomed to being in front of screens. Um, those folks like to do lots of research before they get to your store. When they get to the store, they may not want so much interaction, but they sure will read signs about product because they're researchers. That's kind of the world that they grew up in. So um, I think some product selling signs are there. Okay. How do you build your signs? This is a great tip from Kaiser and Bender. You take basically, when you think about the range of what your customers uh, are in terms of age group, let's just say your, your customers go anywhere from uh, 30 to 60. In terms of years old, you take the, the upper band of that range, let's say it's 60, divide that by 2, and that is 30, so that's what that's how many uh, points your font should be on that sign, 
okay? Um, now, I do think when we talk about signage, it should reflect the personality of your store, the style of your store, who you guys are as a store, that kind of thing. It should not just be a plain blank sign. It shouldn't, it shouldn't be boring. It should have some interesting color to it. It should be interesting. It should reflect your store's personality. Okay, and I do think you got to sprinkle in some safety signs to remind them, you know, this is who we're, this is who we're working on, this is what we're doing, um, uh, this is uh, all about us, that kind of thing, um, and and sprinkling some safety ones there too. Okay, let's put some a sense of humor in there again. Let's stay away from the negative stuff. Okay, and establish who we are as a brand in all of our signage. Okay. Uh, lots of conversation now about what goes on at the cash wrap and at your point of sale. I think you've got to establish that queue, that line that they wait in, and you put markers on the floor so they know what six feet is. Honestly, I wouldn't make the markers at six feet. I'd probably make them eight feet if you can. Here's why you're going to put it down at six feet, and someone's going to swear to you that it's not six feet apart, right? So, you know, I'd stretch that a little bit just so everybody feels that they're totally safe, and there's no question that you are safe on that one, okay? Now, if we're going to line them up that way, and we're going to be that far apart from each other, then while we're online, certainly, you know, there's places for us to put add-on merchandise along the way there for them to be some easy grab and go, some easy pickup stuff that would be fun for them to get. Um, you know, obviously you guys all know that supermarkets do this. If you've been to an office depot, they do it too, right? They put you on kind of a snaky line. But in that line, man, there's like tons and tons of stuff that you could just grab and bring up at the register, right? Uh, so what kind of add-on merchandise can you put there? I think the more the merrier on that one, okay? Uh, you might consider some contactless uh, payment systems. Uh, I, I've heard of some people incorporating Apple Pay uh, or Venmo, PayPal, some of those guys, okay? Um, anything you can do to make that simpler. If you don't do that, okay, um, I think you have to make it almost a ceremony that you are cleaning up the, the credit card machine uh, after and the whole point of sale area after each transaction. It literally needs to be like a big display so that everybody feels safe. Some stores are putting a plexiglass, okay? Uh, if you can do that, great. That's a great thing, too. Again, makes people feel safe. Um, if you can't do the plexiglass thing, at least make a big deal of cleaning between transactions so people can see it, okay? Again, I want to thank my friends at Kaiser and Bender for a lot of the information I got in that last section. There's their website. There's their um, email address. Their phone number is there. Their website is there. Uh, how to contact them through Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and all that kind of stuff is there. They certainly understand layout and store appearance. If you've always wondered about how to do that kind of stuff, please reach out to them. They know that stuff really, really well. So my thanks again to Kaiser and Bender. Let's talk a little bit about marketing. Uh, those of you who know me uh, know that forever I have said that the de there's a two-word definition for marketing, and that definition is creating demand. So as you think about what you're doing in your stores and with your folks, uh, I think the most important thing I can say to you is this. Whatever post you do, whatever email blast you send out, whatever Instagram live event you do, whatever it is, does it create demand? So right as you finish it up, think about that and think, does it make someone want to come to my store or visit me online or reach out to me and do some uh, social shopping or some of that kind of stuff, okay? So if you thought it was lots to do in terms of postings before, if you thought, God, I got to post, I got to email twice a week or three times a week, or I got to do um, uh, social media posting once or twice a day, if you thought it was intense before, it's like two or three times that now. Why? Because people who didn't do it are doing it now. You know, the world has sort of woken up and said, I better have my e-commerce site done. Shopify's um, uh, enrollments are through the roof. Big commerce's enrollments are through the roof. Um, uh, where people were sort of like casual, oh, maybe I'll do an e-commerce site, I don't know, before that. Man, they all jumped on that in the midst of this pandemic. So there's a lot more of that out there, so, okay? Lots more people are doing live events on Instagram, and I'm a huge fan of those. I think they, I've seen that stores are doing really, really well with that, that they actually are getting people to buy through the Instagram event. People doing Facebook live events. Do one or both, okay? It depends on where your customers are at. Um, the way you do these events is you kind of schedule it. You broadcast out to people, hey, we're going to be live. It's going to be Thursday at 3 o'clock. Come and join us. We're going to show you some stuff you, you um, uh, absolutely need to have and that kind of stuff. And just 
make it fun and fresh and that kind of stuff. I think you need at least two people to do it, by the way. You need someone to be on camera showing the merchandise. You need someone behind the camera watching the comments scroll by. And if there's one that's fun to mention or one that's a salient comment or something like that, your person behind the camera can say, hey, Steve uh, said he has that, he loves it, or uh, um, Cindy said, gee, can you hold a, a, a size small for me or any of that kind of stuff. I think, you know, these live events – are keeping you connected to your customers, okay? I've always been a huge fan of email marketing. I'm even more a fan of email marketing. Some people worry about, you know, doing too much. At this point in time, I think you got to do at least two to three emails a week if you're not doing that already. The emails need to be fun. They need to be exciting. They need to not be negative. They need to show that you're here, you're still alive, that your store is doing fine, that you're fine, that you're safe, that you're fun, and that you're fresh. But here's the thing. You've got to match the intensity and the volume of what's going on out there because all your competitors are blasting out like crazy and you've got to keep it going. You've got to, you've got to, you've got to be uh, at the same uh, intensity and velocity that they are at. Okay. So first thing you got to get the message right. Okay. Right now, I do not believe it is about discounts. Yes, as stores open, I believe that the department stores and the major chains are going to offer some kind of bloodletting, crazy discounting. But you know what? That's not what's driving people to stores right now, okay? What is driving them in there is that you're safe and that you're fun and you've got amazing product. And that's always been the best way to market anyway, right? It's never been about discounting. And no one wins in a price war. You don't win. Your vendors don't win. Nobody wins, okay? So you're better off talking about how fun it is to be in the store, how safe it is to be in the store, and it's about getting them back to some kind of normal, okay? Yeah, you should certainly talk about, you know, supporting local retail. I absolutely agree. You should talk about buy now, wear now. You should talk about, you know, how much product that you have and, and how much more longer it's going to last and those kinds of things. I have a lot to say about inventory. We'll do that in a couple of minutes, but um, for sure, you want to make sure that, that um, you're talking about how fun it is to be there, what a great local retail store it is, and, and what product you've got, and how much longer that's going to last, okay? Um, so I think it's this. It's welcome back, my long-lost friend, right? Glad to see you again. Hope everybody's doing well. We're here. We're still your favorites, okay? We're adopting all the things that we should do to keep it safe, to keep it fresh, to keep it fun, to keep it interesting, that kind of stuff. We're doing all of that, okay? But we want to make sure that you guys are uh, are, are, uh, get, are doing okay, and it's been crazy. So come back, join us, be part of the fun that is our store, okay? All right. Um, now, again, I think you got to email two or three times a week. I think you got to do multiple postings each day. I think you got to do lots of videos, okay? And certainly in both Instagram and Facebook, stories, stories, stories are, are the thing. People watch stories more than they look at posts. Um, that's uh, well established in social media right now. So if you can do some of those little stories, you I highly, highly recommend those. I think you take every video you've ever done and create a channel for your business on YouTube and make sure all those are there. Here's why. The number one search engine on the planet right now, as you know, is um, uh, is Google, but the number two out there is YouTube. Okay, so people are searching YouTube as much as they're searching on, on Google. So I think you want to have lots of videos out there and have them properly hashtagged. Now, there's a lot to talk about in terms of hashtags. I could do a whole webinar just on hashtags. But the short version of this um, based on uh, is this, okay? Number one, they should be longer tail hashtags. So you don't want to put hashtag clothing or hashtag fashion. That's not going to get you anything, okay? Um, hashtags that are brand names that are good or vendor names that are good. Hashtags that are a little bit longer are good. About seven hashtags hashtags per post is the right number, okay? Um, and uh, um, I think you can look at other posts of other stores that you admire or vendors that you admire, look at what they're doing in terms of hashtags, and maybe try and incorporate some of those and see if you get some more followers, more friends, more people to like your pages, that kind of thing, okay? Uh, kind of important now more than ever. Now is the time to get more followers and more friends than you've ever had before. OK, we got some May and June holidays that are coming up. Right. So what can people do to celebrate uh, Memorial Day? What can they do to celebrate Father's Day? We still have graduations happening. Even if they're virtual, there's still going to be time for teacher gifts. OK. And those of you who know me know that I'm a big fan of this website called HolidayInsights.com. I'm just going to pop us over there for a quick second. I hope. Here we go. So here's HolidayInsights.com, okay? And it's an interesting website because what they do is they give you all the normal holidays. Like I'm looking at, at June's holidays right here, okay? 
But you know what? Uh, and so they give you the normal ones, right? For Father's Day, blah, 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 that kind of stuff. But for every day of the month, okay, they give you sort of an unusual holiday. And maybe some of these are things that might relate to your store, okay? Um, and maybe there's some things here you can do to celebrate because you know what? Everyone's going to celebrate Father's Day. Uh, uh, everybody celebrates Memorial Day and everybody celebrates the other standard holidays, okay? But, you know, there's some other fun ones in here. There's a Best Friends Day. What could you do with that, right? There's a World Ocean Day. If you're a surf store, what can you do with that? If you're an outdoor store, what can you do with that, okay? Um, it, Herbs and Spices Day. If you're a cooking store, what can you do with that, right? Flip-flop day, right? When, if you're a shoe store, what can you do with that, you know? There's all kinds of holidays in here. <laughs> June 4th is, is, uh, National Hug Your Cat Day. I don't know what you do with that, but maybe you can do something. Um, I think then June 5th should be bandage your face from all the times your cat scratched you day, but, you know, that's just me. So check out HolidayInsights.com, okay? There's some fun stuff there for you to look at, okay? All right, I'll go back to our little PowerPoint here, okay? All right, now, how are we going to sell during this time? What's that going to look like, okay? So think about your customers for a minute. Some are going to be scared. Okay, you want to be warm and gentle with them. You want to welcome them. You want to be attentive to their needs. You want to show that you're being safe. Some are too brave. Some are going to want to run right in there and hug you, right? Um, I think there's probably a balance to be struck there too. Um, I know some of you feel like this whole thing is overblown, and I get that. But I think you know the problem is going to be not so much um, how you work with that customer. It's going to be how anybody else observes you. And again, I'm trying to avoid someone freaking out on your selling floor or someone giving you a nasty Yelp review or so, something like that, right? So strike a balance, keep your distance. Let, you know, they're, they're, you know, they're, the, the, my, my reference point and all this stuff has always been the CDC. I think you got to look at that in terms of their stats and that kind of thing. And let's just keep it as safe and let's err on the side of caution, I guess, is what I'm thinking. Okay. Now, when people do come in, you know, the one thing I try to avoid as much as possible is I wouldn't talk about the virus. I mean, yeah, they're going to talk about it. We're back, that kind of thing. They're going to talk about some of that stuff. But let's start to talk in terms of future. Okay, you're out. Uh, are you headed back to work? What's going to go on now? Okay, uh, where are you headed from here? What have you, you know, um, uh, what are you doing now? Where's it going? Talk about the future, not talk about how hard it's been, how difficult it's been. Don't talk about people you know who are sick. Uh, if they start to talk about that, listen, be attentive, be caring, but try to move them towards a more positive place, okay? So what's next for everybody, okay? I think that's a really important one. You know, as independent retailers, uh, we learned this during the recession. You have to be the ray of sunshine in the midst of all of this, right? So be the ray of sunshine. Be fun. Be a friendly place. Be a place where they can be and just sort of not deal with all the negativity and the worry and the stress and the awfulness that they've been through over the last couple of months, okay? So I, I coined this phrase uh, a couple of webinars before. I probably should have trademarked it, but, you know, that's how that goes. Um, uh, you know, social distancing is not emotional distancing, which means although you're far away, you can still be loving and caring and be glad that they're there and welcome them. And, you know, you got to do it a little, a little, maybe a little higher volume, but, you know, you can still be those things, okay? And, again, I think you've got to look at your signage, look at what your floor looks like. I think you're, the, the way you greet people at the store has to be, you know, even bigger than it's ever been before um, to welcome them, to make them feel safe to ask the more powerful uh, open-ended questions, okay? And, you know, the, I heard this definition of manners a while ago. It's never been more important than right now. The best definition of manners I've ever heard is making the other person feel important, okay? So when someone enters your store, how do I make them feel important? How do I make them feel so – how do they make them feel like we are so glad they are there? Okay, I do think you've got to have some new fitting room uh, policies and procedures. You know, like you've been to hotels. You ever go to a hotel and you see there's like a log in the in the elevator there where they talk about the last time the guy inspected. Maybe we have one of those kind of logs for the last time we cleaned the fitting room. Okay, so everybody can see that we're safe. Okay, I also think, by the way, when people come into the store. Um, both employees and customers, I think it's a good idea to have a little sign-in sheet where they certify that they, are, to the best of their knowledge, that they know they are not sick. Why am I doing that? I'm starting to watch some webinars from some legal people. Look, I'm not a big fan of the whole legal let's be frightened kind of thing, okay? But, you know, the lawyers are all now trying to figure out, like, what is the liability to you as a store owner if someone gets sick? If a customer comes in and they're sick and then one of your employees gets sick, 
what's your liability? Nobody knows. I mean, right now I'm hearing here in the state of California that they, they're encouraging people if that happens to file workman's comp claims and stuff like that. We don't know how that's going to play out yet. I think the way you protect yourself is that everybody has to have some kind of sign-in sheet, both customers, vendors, uh, service people, and employees. And it just says, to the best of my knowledge, I am not sick. So you can demonstrate that you did everything you could to keep people healthy in the store. Okay? Um, so I kind of invented uh, uh, some things about selling. I'll talk about that in a moment. You know, trying on clothing is going to be interesting right now. I think you got to steam things a lot, okay? Um, people are telling me different things about that, okay? Uh, some people are saying they're steaming on the floor right away. Some people are saying if someone's tried something on, as soon as they take it off, if they didn't buy it, it goes right into the back, and they're not going to put it out, except for maybe uh, uh, the next day, or or maybe there's going to be a restocking twice a day of newly steamed things, okay? I, I don't know how that's going to go. Honestly, I really don't. It's going to come down to you on that one. I want to show you one other thing that one of my customers shared with me that I think is sort of interesting. Let's see what you think about this. Um so here is a, a like a it's like a little closet steamer. This is a, a from from LG, okay, um, and it's a it's a little closet steamer, and you you can see if you look at this picture well, I'll try to make it a little bit bigger. That people you can hang up some stuff in there, okay. So you know maybe you make a big ceremony of that, right? You uh, um, after everybody has tried some stuff on. You know, you can hang it up in the thing and they can all see it. I think some, to some degree that you make that a little bit of a ceremony, then people go, oh, okay, um, uh, we're okay, okay? Um, um, you know, they're steaming everything. If not, you can do the steaming on the floor. But it's just another way to do things and think about things, okay? All right, back to that. Um, I talked about uh, the, the cleaning room cleaning procedures. Like you got to show that. Uh, and for those of you that are selling footwear, um, there's a group on uh, Facebook called Shoe Dogs United, and I'm a big fan of that for those of you that are selling footwear. And in the footwear stuff there, they've got um, – some of these stores have actually put together almost like a, pex a plexiglass screen that they can roll up. So there's still a sheet of plexiglass between – you know, the person sitting down and you, so that you're, you know, minimum contact, minimum touching of the people, that kind of stuff. And then you're on the other side wearing a mask, wearing gloves, etc. cetera. Okay. Um, so uh, I think that's kind of an important thing to look at too. At this point, you know what? We're going to have to see how this goes. We're going to have to watch, learn, and adapt based on what's comfortable for customers, what's working, and also watch the stats in terms of infections and that kind of thing and see if they were doing the right things. Okay, so here's my social distance selling idea. See if you like this. Okay, so customer walks in, they sign in, certify they're not sick. Okay, again, I think that's some good legal protection. Okay, now, um, did you ever see at, at some of these office supply stores, they've got like, these little page of, of, of colored dots, right? They're about a quarter inch. They're little dots, like there's blue ones and yellow ones and green ones, that kind of stuff. So maybe we give them a page of, of dots. So customer A has blue dots and customer B has yellow dots and customer C has orange dots, okay? Everybody has their own dots. They walk around the store. They put a dot on the hanger for anything they want to try on, okay? Or, uh, you know, on a fitted, on a folded thing, anything they want to try on, okay? Your salesperson follows up with them, looks for all the blue dots for customer A, grabs all the blue dot stuff, puts it into a fitting room, okay? Customer goes into the dressing room, tries some stuff on. I think you've got to be attentive. Hey, I need a different size, blah, 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 that kind of stuff, okay? Uh, but they basically make two piles. They make a pile of what they like and a pile of what they don't like, okay? The pile that they like um, uh, gets brought to the register. The sales associate takes that stuff there, brings it up to the cashier, and maybe even at that moment in time, the customer leaves the store, and we ring them up kind of like we did with social distancing. Okay? Um, uh, so um, that way, you know, we've done a safe transaction. Okay? Cash, you know, the, then uh, they do the curbside pickup. We come back to the store. We fully clean the POS all over again. So this associate picks up the stuff the customer didn't take, steams it, resets the floor, okay, and recleans the dressing for the next person. Some people like this idea. Some people think it's too extreme. See if it fits within your store and what you want to do, okay? All right. I think the alternative methods of selling are still going to continue. There's still going to be curbside pickup. E-commerce is still going to be important. I think selling through social media. If you haven't had something called comments sold, I think you want to put that in there. Okay. I think delivery services, appointment after hours, and you'll hear this term BOPUS now, buy online, pick up in store. I think that's going to be, uh, uh, um, I think it's going to be a continued thing. 
you know, certainly until things turn back to some level of normal. So I think you want to keep an eye on all of that stuff, okay? Let's talk about your staff for a moment, okay? Now, by the way, some of the stuff that I'm, I'm taking, I'm grabbing from Management One's playbook. There's a link to it here, and uh, there's also a link to their Coronavirus Retail Strategies webinar series. They had some great webinars. I invite you to check them out. They've done a fantastic job. There uh, and the playbook is phenomenal. So, um, uh, oh, I should show that to you really quick. I actually have that in here. So, give me one second. Um, oh, it's not there. Okay. Um, well, I'll sh uh, I'll show it maybe at the end if we have some time. Okay. Um, but um, I, I think that the playbook is really great, and I think you guys should really check it out. So there'll be a link for that. Okay. That said, some are afraid to come back because they're afraid they're going to be sick. Some are afraid that um, um, uh, you know they're making more on unemployment and scheduling is going to be different. You've got to rethink. You, you know, I think you start start by rethinking what you want. Okay. Now you have to know this. It's different state by state. Okay. Here in California, and I think this is true in Texas, but you have to find out. Okay. If you reach out to your staff and you say, we want to have you come back, and they say, I don't want to come back, I'm making more on unemployment, okay? Legally, I know this is true in California, I, I can't speak for other states, but legally, if you, if you offer them a job, okay, and they don't take it, they have at that moment in time voided their unemployment, okay? Different people have different points of view on that one. You have to assess it within your own store and see what's going on, okay? Um, uh, but um, that said, you know, make sure you've thought about what you need. Listen, I'm a big fan of, of, of uh, um, uh, I'm a big fan of, you know, loyalty and that kind of stuff. Um, so, um, uh, you know, if you can be loyal to them and make it work and somehow work through this whole thing, I, I get it. You know, their unemployment's only going to last till July 31st. So I get that it's kind of a, a big chunk of change for them and stuff like that. And I'm not minimizing that, but I do think you have to be cautious about getting the right staff in, and, and, you know, maybe your hours are shifting a little bit, right? Maybe you've got to have special hours for people and that kind of thing. Think about what you need in terms of staffing before you reach out to them, I think, okay? They need to be retrained. We talked just now about telling, uh, about social distance selling. they got to learn about virtual selling. How are we going to clean, right? Because um, here's the other thing I think. when if Even if bigger retailers open, okay, I think what's going to happen is people are going to uh, be watching how you do it, and they're going to have more faith that, fact that an independent retail store is going to do a better job of cleaning than a bigger box store, right? So we have to show that we're doing the right things towards cleaning. They have to know how to do that, right? How do I demonstrate to customers that we're safe? How do I keep it positive? How do I actually keep the conversation going in the right direction? And I don't get mired in the, you know, this virus thing's only going to get worse and we're all going to die kind of conversations, right? Because there are people that want to do that. There are people who want to do that. How do you get them to, to move to the, to the right side of that? Okay, I do think they should be protected. I think they should wear masks and gloves. Some stores have them wearing booties because it is a, a thing that the virus can travel on the soles of people's feet, especially if they're wearing rubber and stuff like that. You know, uh, are they, uh, you know, using hand sanitizer properly? What does our opening and closing procedure look like? Okay, again, have them certify when they when they come in, right? Uh, the, I'm not sick, and then how do we open? How do we clean? How are we closing? How are we cleaning? That kind of stuff. Do you want to take their temperature? It's up to you. Okay, there's lots of those infrared temperatures where you can do it from a distance. And again, it's you're making an effort to keep things clean. Okay, what do they do when they go home? We have friends that are that the guy is a, a postal worker. Okay, and um, the postal worker guy. Okay, um, um, uh, he basically well, here's what happens. Now he's gone to all these people's houses all day. Right, he comes home. He comes into the garage. He takes off his entire postal unit. A worker uniform, puts it in the washer, uh, there's a robe there hanging there for him, runs right into the shower, 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 because in case you didn't know, I mean, obviously people are talking about washing your hands. Why? Because soap and hot water defy, de defeat the virus, right? So he does all that, comes out of the shower, gets dressed, and then tomorrow it's the same thing all over again, okay? So um, uh, that's what they're that's what they're doing, and maybe your staff needs to do something like that too. Okay, again, there's lots of hysteria out there. There's websites both, you know, in support of us being uh, continuing social distancing and staying at home, and others that support, you know, this is all a hoax. I think what you've got to do is look at the CDC because and look at where the actual stats are for your state to keep up on the stats. That's going to keep everybody sane, just the actual numbers. Okay. 
let's talk about your merchandise, okay? So what does your inventory look like right now, okay? Am I sitting on a bunch of stuff that landed for spring right before we got shut down, okay? Is there stuff that we haven't seen before, okay? Is there old inventory tying up dollars? I believe for the balance of this year, <clears throat> turn is king. And you have to, have to, have to have a plan that basically gets your inventories as lean as they can be. You want to be in and out of stuff and turn fast so that you generate profit. And certainly with everybody that we're working with in terms of their merchandise planning and their open-to-buy planning, man, there has never been a more critical time to be looking at that plan and planning your inventory levels and making sure you're out of inventory at the right time. I also am a big fan of something called a vendor scorecard to determine which vendors are are and aren't helping you. Quick uh, uh, jump over to that for a moment. Here's a vendor scorecard. I'm going to send this to you as part of the whole um, presentation here, and I know I'm running a little bit long on time, but but this is a vendor scorecard that we've created for some other folks. You'll get a copy of this. You can look at it. It basically shows what did I receive from them from a vendor, what did I sell, and what am I left with, right? And for all of that stuff, it also shows what's my initial markup on, this, on these vendors, what's my maintained markup right? So <clears throat> if we look at the very bottom of this one really quickly, I want to talk about planned margin versus cash margin, okay? My planned margin, if you look at this one, was 94.71, right? If I received 79.45 at cost, and I was going to put it out at 17.416, okay? The difference between those two is 94.71, okay? Now, what happened in terms of cash? Okay, my sales were 11.446, Okay, but I, I still wrote checks to the vendor for seventy nine forty five. So my cash margin is this eleven four forty six minus seventy nine forty five or thirty five oh one. So I'm short about six thousand dollars from what I really thought was going to happen. Now you can say, well, some of that's over here still in the on hand, and it is. But am I going to get to sell that at full price? Maybe not, especially now. So, you know, you got to start to assess this on a vendor by vendor basis. Who are your A vendors? Who are your B vendors? Who are your C vendors? If you don't, if you've got a system that can put this together, I encourage you to do it. If you're on Retail Pro, the guys at CDS can help you do it. I can help you do it. If you're not on Retail Pro and you need some help with that, please reach out to me. That's what we're here to do. We're here to help you with some of that stuff and we will absolutely, absolutely get you what you need to make all this work. Okay. All right. Um, now, so I do not think you should do blanket markdowns right now. I've talked about that before, but um, I think what you want to do basically is you want to have um, uh, uh, some targeted markdowns, right? What can I sell that's going to bring people in, or what can I mark down that's going to bring people in, and then sell some other stuff at full price if you can. It's certainly time for buy now, where now. We talked about that before. Wherever you can do that, that's going to be important. Where can you create some bundling? How do we create some more demand? I talked about that in the marketing side of things, okay? And how do I plan some targeted promotions? Some people have talked to me about packing and holding merchandise. I'm not a fan. I'd rather you get out of it as best you can right now. Obviously, if you've got winter coats, it ain't going to happen now. You've got to pack and hold those. But if there's anything that you can avoid, pack and hold on. Uh, uh, let's get out of it now. Let's convert it to cash now. Cash is king. It's never been more true than right now. Okay, let's talk about your vendors for a moment. You know, are they still holding your spring orders open? Don't know if they are or they're not. If they are, then you might want to rethink what they're doing, okay? Um, and you might want to, you got to talk about whether or not they're going to need those goods. If you really need those goods, many, many vendors right now are, are putting things on hold, okay? Uh, or they're not even shipping. Some people are just saying, we're canceling those orders. Sometimes they couldn't make it, right? So, you know, we got to really figure out who's in and who's out, okay? Um, so I, I do think it's an important time to sort of think that through, okay? Uh, and find out what are they still holding open for you, okay? Also, maybe ask for some discounts on that. A lot of vendors, uh, a lot of retailers are telling me, boy, you know what? Uh, a lot of, uh, um, I owe them some money to, to uh uh, uh, my vendors and they're starting to pressure me a little bit, but many of them are being pretty cool. Okay. So talk to them about it. What can you really do? Okay. Establish a pay plan that's effective and frankly, ask them for the sun, moon and stars, ask them for 90 days. Okay. I think many of them understand, um, uh, that, that this is, you know, where we're at right now. Many of them are being very, very supportive. Sometimes the factors aren't, but you know, I think you got to be honest. You got to be forthright. You gotta, um, you gotta tell them what's really happening, what's true, and what's not true, and you gotta do your best job to negotiate that as best you can. Okay? Uh, and in that negotiation, I think you gotta look at things like, listen, you know, I lost all these weeks, I lost 10 weeks, I'm not getting that back. It's not like, you know, uh, it's just a delay, I'm not getting that back. So, 
that's going to affect how your um, markdowns are going to roll, and it's going to. And, and so they've got to be thinking about that in terms of discounts. And will they participate in your markdowns, your sales contests, that kind of stuff? You got to talk to them. You got to ask those questions. You got to partner with them to make it happen, and use the vendor scorecard to see if they're contributing to your cash flow or not. If they're not, man, this is the time to cut. Uh, uh, guys that aren't helping you. But you know what else it's a time for? It's a time to consider vendors who maybe in the past said to you, you know what? Can't ship you. Uh, um, can't do it. You know, I already got someone there, blah, 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 that kind of stuff. I am finding that more and more of these people are willing to do stuff they weren't willing to do before. So you know what? Now there may be some people they can't ship, so they'll ship you instead. Okay? So I contact the vendors if you if you are able to take goods and want to take goods. I contact the vendors that uh, you did, weren't able to get goods from before and see if they'll give you goods now. Okay, uh, here's that slide on cash margin. I talked about it in the vendor scorecard one, and we're running long, so I'm going to omit this now. But please read this one carefully when you get this presentation. I think the math is important for you. Okay, um, I think seasons are going to shift a little bit. What I'm hearing is that spring is going to get extended. Okay, that most people that would have taken markdowns June, July are not going to take them till August. Okay, if that does happen that way, again, fall could be a shorter season. Okay, so we got to have a plan that gets us out of spring goods at the right time and also out of fall goods at the right time. Okay, turn is king. You got to make sure you've planned your inventories. You got to make sure that you're generating profit out of that, and cash margin is also super important. Okay, so for fall and holiday, some of the questions you got to start to ask your vendors now is how did this pandemic affect your ability to deliver goods to me there? I'm already hearing it, that some vendors are not able to ship goods or they're going to be late for fall because they didn't get raw materials from overseas, they didn't get the goods produced, they, their factories were shut down, that kind of stuff. You need to understand where everybody is at in that regard. Okay, kind of important. You need to understand where that's at. Okay, um, um, anyway. Um, I think you got to look at that, okay? Um, so there you go, okay? You make sure your, your plans are lean and mean. I think holiday could be a little bit more aggressive. I think that there's going to be some pent-up demand, and I think people are going to want to have a, a happier holiday after all this nightmare. So I think we could see a better holiday. Now, there's all kinds of variations on a theme there. Some people believe that. Some people don't. You have to sort of take that out and take a look, okay? All right. Here we go. So again, and I think this is so important, so I kind of saved it for here, okay? You need a sales plan that's achievable, that's based on reality. I'm amazed that, you know, we, we reforecasted everything, and boy, our plans are sort of kind of right on uh, with most of the people I've done open and buy with planning so far this month. I'm amazed at how close they've come. We really, really do have that dialed in. If you don't have a good sales plan, you've got to contact us, and we'll help you with that, okay? At the same time, if you we've, we've also got to give you an inventory plan that is achievable, okay, that enables you to be in cash more than in inventory so you can react and change fast. You've got to plan those ending inventories to make sure that you know what's going on there and that you're out of goods and on to the next thing. Super, super important, okay? So, look, all this stuff is really, to my mind, the core functionality of, of, of profitable retailing, right? Knowing what your inventory looks like. Inventory is your biggest expense. It's also your biggest asset. It's your biggest liability, okay? So the key to it is is finessing that, controlling it, okay? Uh, the systems that the guys at um, at CDS sell are critical for measuring that stuff and seeing what goes on. And then our planning systems are critical in forecasting so you know what to buy, when to land it, and how do you get cash out of it, okay? The two together is what's going to make you – is the difference between good retailing and great retailing. So please, please keep that in mind. Okay, jump into finance a little bit right now. Cash is king. It's time to redo your break-evens. It's time to try to set up as much incentivized uh, um, expenses as you can. Lots of people are turning to the landlords and asking for um, uh, and asking for um, percentage-based rent. I think you got to ask for that until we're at 100%. So let's do it. Okay. Uh, we have a thing called the PPP plan, and we're going to give that to you for those of you that have PPP money, so you can plan a how that money is going to get spent, and and b um, how you're going to set yourself up to to get the the forgiveness on that. Okay. Negotiate hard with everybody. It's, right now, this is the time to be negotiating. Okay. Uh, because people need to do business and they need to get stuff together, and so I think you got to make that happen. Okay. Um, now, along the lines of the PPP, some of you have gotten PPP money, okay? There is more PPP money that opened up. Um, 
If you're working with a bigger bank and you're not hearing things, contact me. We've got direct connection with some SBA lenders that may be able to help you get this thing going. If you've got questions about it, reach out to me. We can help you with that, okay? I believe if you've gotten PPP money, it's good to either create a separate checking account or at least a separate general ledger account because here's the thing. You want to make that application to get that stuff forgiven as fast as you can make it, okay? Um and you want to have your facts straight on that one. And you want to make it simple and easy to get approved. I have customers who had crazy things go on with their, their payroll stuff and didn't submit it well when they submitted for their PPP. And they got shot down by the, the, the monster banks right away because it was just too easy to decline them because they're overwhelmed. Okay? So by having a separate checking account, separate general ledger account, and making sure this data is as clean as a whistle is to the degree that you will get this stuff forgiven. Uh, people are talking about will they allow the forgiveness to go beyond June 30th. To tell you the truth, I'm not hearing that's going to happen. In fact, I'm hearing the reverse. I'm hearing that they're going to stick to the June 30th thing. So unfortunately, that's how that goes. Okay? The other loan that's out there is the EIDL. Now, here's the thing about the EIDL. A lot of you applied for it. You got like a grant that was based on the number of people that um, you had in the store. So if you had six employees, you got $6,000 on the EIDL. That's not the end of the story. When you applied for that, it's still a 30-year, 3.75% loan. It's the cheapest money you're ever going to see, right? So if you, I hope you applied for it. Um, even if you turn it down, at least you want to be in the pool and you can make that choice depending on how things go. Now, it's starting to fund. I'm starting to hear people are getting it. It's just starting right now for the people that applied for it earlier, okay? What, what happens is you get an email that says, we're working on it, but we're really busy, okay? And then you get another message that says, hey, there's a portal. Click here, log in, and answer our questions, right? So they're going to have questions for you like, did you ever live at 123 Main Street? And... Um, uh, is this a relative of yours? You know, stuff that they ask a lot of times when they're trying to really fully establish that's you. A lot of times uh, funding organizations do that, okay? Then they're going to show you this is the maximum amount we've, we've um, uh, allocated to you. How much of it do you want? And there's like a little slider bar where you can say, you know, uh, that, okay, they, they picked out $50,000. No, nah, I really only want thirty, or no, I want forty. I want the full fifty. You slide that bar around to where you want it, okay? You click it. I'm, what I'm finding is that once you've said this is what I want, that the approval happens very quickly, okay, and then the funding of it happens within two or three days of the approval. So again, I'm starting to see it now. Watch for those emails, okay? Check your spam a lot um, uh, and make sure that you're, you're not missing those things, okay? All right. For those of you that have not done it, I'm a big believer in getting in, in filing uh, against your business interruption insurance. Your broker, okay, is going to tell you don't do it. Do it anyway, okay? Um, you want to file an official claim. Your broker's going to say, you know what, we're not paying these. You probably shouldn't do it. And uh, uh, if you do it, your rates are going to go up. Their job in this whole thing is to try to prevent claims from happening. But let me tell you what's happening in this thing, okay? Um, uh, four states have already enacted legislation that says those insurance companies cannot decline you. Typically, they decline it because uh, you've been told or they'll tell you that it, it's something you can't see. Like uh, fire insurance or a fire is something we can see, right? A flood is something we can see. A virus is something we can't see, so we're declining you. We're declining the business interruption, the force majeure, or whatever legalese they've got in there, okay? You're also going to start to see lots of attorneys now who will say, we'll take on your case. We'll do it on contingency. Wait. Here's what you want to do first. You want to check your state legislature. See if there is any kind of bill that's being that's going through your state legislature that's forcing the insurance companies to um, uh, to pay this thing. If there is, wait and see what happens with that legislature because um, if um, if it passes that, then you don't have to pay the attorney's fees to get it. Now it's law, and typically the insurance companies pay that. If your state doesn't do it, then there's one, there's a million lawyers who will take this thing on on contingency, so there's no out of pocket for you. If you want that, reach out to me. We have a couple of lawyers that are ready to take that on uh, across the nation, okay? But do file that, okay? All right, again, my thanks to Management One. A lot of what you saw here was based on their playbook. Uh, I encourage you to get it. We'll send you the link for it. Download it, use it. It's going to be there, okay? So this is the time for action. I'm going to wrap up the webinar here with these couple of slides, and then I'll open it up for questions if you have any, okay? But here's the thing, okay? I think you plan a short, um, a short list for reopening, okay? I think you look at it and go, like, let's do a soft opening and then a grand opening. 
Okay, just to test out your procedures, make sure everybody's back, make sure things are working okay. Uh, go through the sections here and then make your plans, get the Management One playbook, work with me or my team at Retail Smart Guys to map out how this is going to happen. Let us look at your inventory. Let us look at your future deliveries. Let us plan what's happening for you. And I want to show you this one other thing really quick. I hope I have it open here. Yeah, I do. Okay, so look at this. I have put together, based on this webinar, a reopening checklist. You will all get it for attending this webinar. But basically, it's all here. All the things that we've talked about are all in this checklist, so you can utilize this to get your store back open. Okay? And certainly, I'm a believer in that one. You know me. But anyway, okay. Um, let me get back to where we were. Okay, so we're con I've converted all this into a checklist. I'm going to refine it a little bit. It's going to come out to you over this weekend. Okay, so watch for that. Now, from my heart, what I truly believe, what I think is important right now is this. Okay, first off, every uh, politician on planet Earth has said that small business is the backbone of the economy. Of course, it's true. You know it's true, okay? You are the backbones of, of your own neighborhoods, of your own societies, right? You're the ones that make the donations to some kid's little league thing or a kid's orchestra or, or the Girl Scouts or the Boy Scouts or whatever thing is going on. You're the ones who are leaders in your neighborhood. You're the ones who are leaders in your community, and they are looking to you to reopen safely and sanely and get us back to some level of normal, and everybody from the top down needs your store to survive. So if you're the backbone of your of your uh, community and your society, you know, and this may be a stretch and maybe I'm exaggerating, but I'm sorry. I believe you are the backbone of humanity itself. You're important and you must survive. OK, so the world is counting on you to make it through. But here's the thing. You don't have to do this alone. OK, we are here to help you. OK, so please, if you're worried, if you're scared, if you need a plan, reach out. That's what I'm here to do. That's what CDS is here to do. We're all here to help make sure that you make it. You have to make it. We have to make sure that you do. So please reach out to us. Um, uh, we want to help you. We want to give you as much resources as we can. So please join us. In, in doing that, we're collecting up information from retailers all across the nation, all across the world. We work with people in 16 countries now. I'm hearing all kinds of things. I'm collecting up the best of the best ideas. I'm happy to share those with you, but you got to reach out to me. To that degree, on this screen, I have all of my contact information, okay? Uh, my cell phone is there. And let me tell you, during this whole pandemic thing, you know, we're on, we're on call. We're on alert 24-7. So um, you need something, reach out to me. Call my cell phone, okay? Then my email is there. My website is there. I'm here to help you any way I can to help you get open, okay? You can do it. We're here to help you. There are tools to help you. There are strategies to help you, but you have to get open, okay? With that, um, if you have some questions, go ahead and pop into the uh, chat area there, and I'm happy to, um, to answer any of those for you, okay, if there's something that you really want to talk about. OK, or something that you specifically need. And certainly if you want to email me, my contact information is there uh, as well as as um, uh, you get you'll get all these slides. You'll get all the things I, I talked about in here, too. OK, um, <clears throat> uh, let's see uh, what's coming here. OK, some people are talking about the steamer. Uh, you know, that the that steamer that I did show. Yes, it is a. Uh, uh, there is a 20-minute uh, uh, um, cycle time on that. Uh, thank you, Jeremy, for pointing that out. It is true, and it is about 1,200 bucks. I'm not telling you it's cheap. So some people don't want to do that. They just want to show that they're steaming stuff on the floor. You know what? Go for it. Do it. I'm with you. Okay. Um, make that happen. Let's let's see that that go on there. Um, some people are asking about. Uh, let's see. Um, Something on social media, you know, if you haven't heard of something called Comment Sold, it's a great way to sort of get some of that stuff cooking there. I'm a big fan of Comment Sold. I'm a big fan of of, um, of how that all works, okay? Um, I do think that there's fast ways to get some of your websites up and running quickly, okay? Um, let's see here. Um, oh, here's a, a tip from Lisa. Thank you for this, Lisa. Lisa received a tip from a... Uh, a sunglass company, good way to clean frames without ruining lens coatings or acetate is to use uh, uh, some peroxide wipes. Thank you, Lisa. Great tip there. And then um, 
Uh, she's asking, how do we try on shoes safely? So again, if you look at Shoe Dogs United on on uh, Facebook, they've invented some kind of plexiglass. Uh, interesting ways to do that, Lisa. If not, I think you know uh, some of the shoe vendors have talked about wipes that are safe for wiping down shoes without damaging them. Okay, and I do think you want to clean those and make a big ceremony of cleaning those before uh, you go to the next customer. Okay. Um, okay. Some employee questions here. Um, yeah. Uh, so someone's asking about, you know, if we do different, if we do different hours, what's going to happen to our PPP forgiveness? What's going to happen is if you're not experiencing the same level of, of payroll that you had before, then what happens is it prorates the forgiveness amount. Okay. Um, again, if you have questions about that, reach out. We're here to do that. We're here to help on that one. Okay. Um, okay. Here's a question. Um, what about if we do big discounts, isn't that going to create bigger crowds? It may. And so you may have to do some lineup outside of the store. I, I, you know, it's a weird place to be along those lines, but I think, you know, um, doing some of those markdowns and maybe some online markdowns and some markdowns that are geared more towards, um, social distancing and curbside pickup, that kind of thing might be the way to go. Okay. All right, you know we're, it's twelve ten. We're out of uh, my time, so two ten Texas time, and so you guys are all over the place. So I, I know we've got people from everywhere. I want to thank you all for attending today's webinar. I hope this was helpful to you. We will send all the stuff out to you again. Keep it safe, okay? Um, uh, have fun out there. Make it fun. Make it safe. You will survive. Reach out to me. Email me. Call me. Talk to me about how I can help you. That's what I'm here to do. Okay? Thanks again, everybody. Have a great day, and we'll talk really soon.